Hello everyone, it's the latest edition of the Liverpool Blood Red Academy show. I'm your host Mo Stewart and I'm joined once again by Matt Addison as we look through all the news and headlines from the youth of the Liverpool Football Club. In today's edition we'll be dissecting the Derby Day draw after the under-23s took on their Evertonian counterparts on Saturday. We'll be giving Kai Gordon some flowers after he got off the mark for the senior side in the FA Cup. We'll be looking at what the future holds for the rest of the season for the under-23s and the 18s. And we'll be also looking over at our second favourite, Brazilian goalkeeper. But let's start with the derby, Matt, because it is always a big deal, no matter what level Liverpool play Everton, whether it's Tibby Winks, football, arm wrestling, you name it. And... We're gonna. I feel like uh, the red side are coming away a little bit disappointed, not just because of the nature of the late equaliser, but considering they had a lot of the players who had been in senior action back into the team, it was a stronger feel. There was a real feeling that they could go into this game and put a marker down, and it didn't quite work out that way. No, it was uh, it was one of those games. I think you come away a little bit frustrated. I think for both Liverpool and Everton, there will be some frustrations. I think Everton have, have got a pretty decent youth setup as well. We should probably say that there's yeah. certainly not as much of a difference between the the senior teams uh, between the youth teams rather as as there is at, at senior level. So I think yeah, for for Liverpool to go one in front and then not to win would have been a, a little bit of of a frustration. Obviously, you always want to win these games. I think it's important to to each of the players it's important to be able to show that you can stand up and, and be counted in in these mm -hmm. kinds of, of fixtures but yeah ultimately we do say it a lot on this podcast it's it's not really about the results it's about what you learn from them and I think that will be the the message really from from Barry Lutus and, and from all of, of the coaching staff mm -hmm. obviously it's it's a case of Liverpool having gone in front on about an hour and then having not won that game what can you learn from that? How do you make yeah. sure that that doesn't happen in future, whether it's Everton, whether it's somebody else? It doesn't particularly matter. I think if if you're ahead as they were with sort of six or seven minutes left on the clock, you want to be finding a way to, to get through and, and win that game by a goal to nil. And unfortunately, they couldn't do that. Yeah. And like you say, game management, something that normally is a, a fixture of maturity, something they probably haven't quite learned yet. Also, we again, we, we can't ignore the fact that it is a derby. And it was the kind of game after Liverpool got the goal. Early on, it was very much kind of a bit bitty. But once that goal came, there were chances at both ends. And maybe there was a sense that because Everton were still getting chances, they felt like they had to go out and get a second goal. And that ultimately cost them. Yeah, it was it was fairly open at times, wasn't it? I think, again, it, it comes back to that maturity and that kind of just being able to, to put your foot on the ball at certain times. I think it's it's interesting that Liverpool weren't particularly able to do that when you look at, at some of the players that were, were playing in that game. Obviously, Leighton Clarkson has come back. You'd think that he'd be one that would have that kind of nous to be able to, to sort of keep hold of the ball for a little bit and, and just dictate the tempo. You think of someone like a, a James Balagizi as well has been pretty good at, at doing things like that. Mm -hmm. There's there's players in there that you'd think would have, have been able to, to do a little bit better in terms of, of controlling it. I think... Those those will be the sort of key things to, to take yeah. forward and, and learn from it. It's like you say, it, you can't expect it necessarily of a youth team, but it is something that they're going to have to learn sooner rather than later. And I think uh, an under twenty three is derby. If if you're not going out on loan at, at that level, I think that's mm -hmm. the kind of game that is kind of ones that you would measure. You know where they're at in terms of of their ability and, and their ability to to step up. So. Yeah, a little bit of, of frustration there, but uh, still still a few positives. And look, they haven't got beats. So that's not a bad thing. No, and that is the bottom line. I think that's probably the one thing that they'll all be taking away from this game. Now, obviously, you mentioned Leighton Clarkson and some of the players who do have some ability on the ball. One who was missing, well, technically two who were missing, Tyler Morton, but also Kyde Gordon, who were still on first team duty. Undoubtedly, the team like that is going to miss them because they are two of their best players. I mean, would you say that was the difference? Do you think those two in the team and you looking at a victory? Possibly, yeah. It's quite easy to, to say that, isn't it? But I think that there's a good chance that that is the case, to be honest. I think both of them were, were actually there down in, in Kirby yeah. to watch the game. They were both stood on the, the sidelines watching it and watched the, the under-18s as well. They were, were unfortunate to lose to Manchester City. So it was a, a frustrating sort of weekend all round in terms of, of that. But obviously for those two, the biggest thing is that they could go on and, and be in the squad or even come on in the case of, of Gordon for a Premier League debut. So 
yeah, again, it's it's one of those things. I think for Liverpool, if they were desperate to win the mini derby, yes, of course, you would have played those two players. Of course, you know, you, you'd you'd rather have that extra bit of quality in your team. But it's far more important that they were able to to have the experience that they did against Brentford. Ultimately, that's going to you know pave the way for for future appearances for for the pair of them. So, yeah, I think it's it's one of those where they probably would have made the difference, but that's really not important. Yeah, and again, something that we go back to quite often on this show, we have to remember what the ultimate priority is and it's producing great players for the first team. And so if we've done that, it almost feels kind of counterproductive to bring them back, even if the two of them themselves probably would have liked to have been out there and were probably kicking and heading every ball sitting on the sidelines. So let's talk about there the, in the first team, and particularly Kyde Gordon, because as I mentioned at the top of the show, he did get his first senior goal in the FA Cup game against Shrewsbury. He then came on, uh, against Brentford at the weekend. Almost got his first Premier League goal as well. The great save from the Brentford keeper to deny him. But he seems to be making, every time we have a new show, he seems to be breaking new ground. And none of it seems to phase him, which I find the most kind of comforting thing as an onlooking, particularly I feel quite protective over some of these young guys when you think about the spotlight that's been shining on them now. Yeah, exactly that. I mean, in terms of, of the goal against Shrewsbury, I think that was absolutely a mature finish, wasn't it? It was so easy for him to, to snatch at that or to try and just blast one in, but he didn't. He just placed it, curled it in, didn't need to put the, the most power on it, but he just put it in a, a position where the goalkeeper wasn't able to, to get across. And I think to, to do that at his age, he's not long turned 17, to be able to just give yourself that extra yard inside the penalty area to curl the ball in I think that that does show you know a huge sign of, of his maturity and to be honest I think even even a few months ago we wouldn't have been able to, to see that from him but you can obviously see training with Mohamed Salah players like that is is really rubbing off on him and th there's a few youngsters that we're going to come on to one in particular which I think is, has really benefited from playing with players um, sort of in a similar sort of mold as him and I think I think that's a, a huge thing I think it's it's a trend we're probably going to see a little bit moving forward. I think we've seen it, obviously, at Liverpool with someone like Curtis Jones, who didn't go out on loan. They decided it was probably better to keep him in-house and, and training yeah. and learning from those around him. We've seen it with you know, other clubs. Phil Foden, the obvious example, at, at Manchester City, they felt it was best for him to stay put rather than go somewhere else. And I think we, we probably are going to see that with with Morton and, and Gordon as well. It's, it's not out of the question that they can go out on loan, but Obviously, we mentioned Leighton Clarkson before he's come back because it didn't quite work. You wonder whether that was was the right move for him. I think for someone like Kate Gordon, as long as Mohamed Salah signs that new contract and is here for, for the next sort of four or five seasons, which we obviously have everything crossed, that that is the case. Um, I, I just don't think there's there's a better place for, for him to develop and to learn. And like you say, every time we do one of these shows, which is you know every three or four weeks, I mean, He's making new steps, he's taking new progress, he's doing things that we've not seen him do before. If that continues, then it's, mm -hmm. it's just massively exciting. It is. And the whole concept of the kind of in-house mentorship is really interesting to me because we've seen, as you mentioned with Leighton Clarkson, loans can be so hit and miss because obviously Harvey Elliott goes to Blackburn, has a great time. Leighton Clarkson's Blackburn is a very different club in a very short space of time. And at that stage in the development, so many, such a big jolt like that can have such massive consequences. So the idea of keeping these players in-house and essentially asking the senior players to groom their replacement, something that in past times might have caused friction, to be able to use it to our advantage, I really feel like not just in terms of transfer funds and what have you, but in terms of that connecting thought from and the transition from the academy to the senior team, it really could pay dividends in the future. Yeah, it absolutely can because I think it's it's not just important for the future, but it's important now. I think that obviously this season we don't expect that Kay Gordon is going to come on loads in terms of having minutes. I think it's probably a rare sign that he comes off the bench in the Premier League, a sign that there's obviously been injuries this weekend, there's players at AFCON and, and all of that kind of thing. So as long as there's no kind of injury crisis or there's not loads of absences, I wouldn't imagine that he's going to play a huge amount before the end of this season. But you look ahead to, to next season and, you know, even as soon as that, you can see him starting to get a few more appearances. And it's it's not just beneficial to have 
someone in the same mould as Salah for when Salah moves on. But it's also important to have that next season. It's important that if Salah needs 20 minutes to have a break, you're not bringing on someone like Zedan Shakiri, for example, in the, the recent past, who's come on and been a good player, but a very different type mm-hmm. of, of player, a different style of footballer, one that doesn't necessarily quite fit in. I think if you've got players that you can bring in and Obviously, they're not the same quality yet. Hopefully, one day, you know, Kate Gordon might go on and, and do something like that without wanting to, to put too much pressure on him. But, you know, I think to have someone in that same mould who can play the role in a similar sort of way, I think is is really important as well. And look, Liverpool don't have the, the money of, of City and, and Chelsea and the other teams. They've got to do it a different way. I think Manchester City have got so many different options, haven't they, in terms of Riyad Mahrez isn't there at the moment, but no one's really noticed. They've got so many players who can just come in and play. And I think, like I say, Liverpool can't just go and spend £60 million on a backup. So if they can develop one in the same sort of mould, I think that's absolutely the right way to go about it. Yeah, and I mean, Mahrez will be back soon by the looks of it as well. So we need all the help we can get. <laughs> <laughs> so so let's look, kind of fast forward to where we expect to see more of Kai Gordon then, the under-23s. Um, obviously... The rest of the season, we mentioned priority-wise, there may well be some minutes, but when the full squad comes back, it's going to be harder. They are kind of mid-table at the moment in the Premier League too. Um, They've got some tough fixtures still to come. They've still got to play the rest of the top floor, plus uh, a Chelsea team with a very good reputation at youth level, and then another derby game against Manchester United. What can we really expect from Barry Lewis aside between now and the end of the year? What do you see as being their aims? I think, again, it's going to come down to development. I think we we see it a lot with the youth team, particularly in the sort of second half of the season. Quite often players will leave in January if maybe there's sort of loan deal on the cards. I'm not too sure whether that will be the case this year because of of COVID, I think Liverpool will be slightly wary of letting too many players leave just because they'll need sort of backup options in, in certain areas. But I think we, we do see a lot of, of inconsistency in terms of, of the results. So I wouldn't expect them to finish much higher than, than where they are now. I think they're sort of mid-table now. I think that's pretty much where they, they're going to finish. I think it's it's just a case really of looking at, at those games. Obviously, Manchester City is, is an interesting one to, to watch out for with all of the, the talent that they've got. Chelsea, like you say, have got a good reputation. I think if if Liverpool could finish ahead of Chelsea, that would be would be fairly impressive. If they can be ahead of Everton as well, I know they missed the, the chance to go above them this weekend, but I think they've got a game in hand and they're only a point behind them. So I think it's it's a case of trying to get yourself as, as high up the table as possible, but it's not really about that. I think it's, broadly speaking, going to be a mid-table finish, similar to, to what it was in, in the past two or three seasons. But Look, if if Kate Gordon gets a few more games, if Tyler Morton can play in the Champions League again, if you know there's one or two others that can come in and, and play, if maybe Leighton Clarkson goes out on loan and has a better time of it in the second half of the season than he did in the first, all of those things are far, far more important for Liverpool. So mm. that's where you've got to measure them. I think it's it's not really about the results, it's about the outcome of that at the end of this season. And indeed, when we're thinking about players progressing up the football food chain, as we call it. <clears throat> There's going to be um, uh, a development from the younger group as well. So in terms of the under-18s, maybe that's going to be some of their um, their main aims between now and the end of the season. Looking at some of the younger guys saying, are they going to be a part of this group next season? Where can we fit them in the squad? Particularly if they think that some of their guys are going to be further up, higher on for longer when it comes to next season. Yeah, I think it's it's always a big period, isn't it, to, to work out kind of even something as simple as who's going to go on the, the pre-season in the summer. We don't know quite how that's going to look in terms of will there be a tour, will there be going to America or, or wherever. It's far too early to, to kind of dictate those things given the, the current situation, obviously, with, with COVID and, and the pandemic and the rest of it. But wherever they go, there's going to be a big group of, of youngsters that go with them. There's players in there. I mentioned James Balagizi before. He got injured just before pre-season last year last season didn't quite get the, the look of, of being able to, to go and, and impress there. So yeah, it's it, it's a big few months in term in terms of kind of determining the 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 kind of pecking order of, of who's first in line, who's second and, and so on and so forth. Because there are so many talents that are coming through. There's there's lots of players. I know we spoke on the the last show about it's not just Kate Gordon. You've got someone like Bobby Clark who impressed this weekend. You've got Malcolm Frauendorf who people saw in the FA Cup for the first time. 
you know, there's there's plenty of, of options who all play in kind of similar positions. So it's just a case of, of jostling really ahead of, of the summer. And mm-hmm. it's always it's always interesting to see the, the pre-season squad list that goes away with Liverpool because you can kind of work out the, the two or three that do go, they're obviously at, at the top of, of that short yeah. list that Jurgen Klopp's got his eye on. So it's always a, a fairly big determinant, I think, in terms of who's going to make it and who won't. And I'm sure that, that everybody within the Kirby knows exactly that and will be absolutely pressing to get their names on that list. Now, for the under-18s, they do still have a live competition. They are in FA Youth Cup uh, fourth round action this week against Burnley. After last season's fantastic run to the final that ultimately fell at the last hurdle, they're going to be champing at the bits and maybe go one better. Do you think that they've got a chance, as we mentioned, with all this talent lying around the place? Yeah, absolutely. They've got a chance. I mean, it was was Aston Villa, wasn't it, who uh, who beat them in the final last season. They're already out. I think they went out in the the third round to to Leicester City. I think it was off the top of my head. And it's it's a really interesting sort of draw this time. Obviously, Liverpool playing Burnley uh, Tuesday night. So I'm going to go down and, and watch that hopefully. And the winner of that game will play Chelsea. So another big hitter in that one. I think it's Everton against Manchester United as well in in the fifth round. So. I think there's there's going to be a couple of big teams that get knocked out. There's already, obviously, the holders have been knocked out. It's kind of opening up a, a little bit. Manchester City are still in there. You'd fancy them to go quite far in it. They tend to to get to a, at least the semi-finals, if not a little bit further. But you look at, at some of the teams that are left in it, if Liverpool can get through, obviously Chelsea then is is a big one. Um, but I think if, uh, if they can get through the, the next couple of rounds, absolutely, they'll be up there amongst the favourites because, as I say, the, the holders are already out. There's mm. kind of a, a little bit of an opportunity, I think, in this competition. And sometimes you need that little bit of luck with the draw to go your way if you're going to take the trophy. Now, in the last round, the star was our favourite pole, Matthias Mazzioloski, who managed to get himself a hat-trick. He's looking to make this competition his own. And as we've seen already, the FA Youth Cup is one that's got a storied history. So if you do do well in this, you will start to be heard and seen in a wider context for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there's plenty of, of opportunities, isn't there? The further you go in the, the tournament, there's opportunities to, to play at Anfield and, and things like that. Liverpool beat Arsenal in the, the semi-final last season. That was a game obviously without fans at that point in mm-hmm. time, but it was you know, still an opportunity to, to go and play at Anfield, which you don't turn down, obviously, <laughs> at, at any point. So, yeah, I think there's there's going to be opportunities for, for people to make names for themselves. And we've seen, obviously, a few of these young players, as I mentioned, you know, the, the likes of, of Fraundorf and, and so on in the actual FA Cup for, for the senior teams. But I think this is this is another opportunity. It's it's a competition that, that people always keep an eye out for, isn't it? It's a bit like the, the UEFA Youth League. It's it's a little bit more than just the under-18s Premier League or, or the yes. Premier League Cup. It's It's got a bit of, of prestige attached to it. So, yeah, a, a huge opportunity. Mosielowski is, is one of those to keep an eye on, but certainly not the only one. And as you say, in terms of the opportunity, I believe from the semi-final stage, it's televised. ITV yeah. have had it picked up for the last few seasons there. So, again... That puts you into the living rooms of about millions, potentially millions of new eyes. So yeah, I mean, you only have to, to look at last season as well. I mean, Stephen Gerrard now working with Carney Chuck Maweka at, at Aston Villa. He was one of those that that stood out. There's there, there's so many examples of of players, Manchester City's players as well. You look at someone like Liam Delap. I think played quite a lot this season. James McAtee has played a little bit in in uh, Pep Guardiola's team and. Um, there's another lad whose name Cole Palmer. Cole that's Palmer. I'm trying to think of. Yeah. yeah, that's the one who scored, <laughs> didn't he, in the the FA Cup against Swindon. So all of these players for for Manchester City fans, for for Villa fans, it's it's the first opportunity to to see them, and it, it wouldn't surprise you at all if there was maybe one or two players in this Liverpool team who could do similar. Well, fingers crossed they get through the test of Burnley and then on to the next round against Chelsea. But definitely one to watch out for after last season. There was a lot of uh, heartwarming uh, action uh, from and reactions from the run to the final last season. So let's hope for more of the same this year. Now, before we wrap up today's show, we have your one to watch as ever. Now, someone else who may have been heard in the previous shows, but... He deserves to come back, I think, of Brazilian young man, uh, Marcelo Pitaluga, the goalkeeper, who has found himself, like Kate Gordon, advancing in his development since we last spoke. He found himself 
on the bench for both the EFL Cup game against Leicester, but also the Premier League game away at Stamford Bridge. Now, obviously, if you're a young player, you're on the bench, you don't get on. You are kind of in the Premier League squad. You are still training in the same way you are getting on the bus in the same way you are in and amongst the dressing room as if you were a senior player. But I think it's slightly different when you're a goalkeeper because a substitute goalkeeper is always going to be doing the same thing. So if, you, if, you're a, if you're a substitute youth player and you're on the bench, you think, okay, normally I could get on, but I'm not going to get on because I'm a youth player. But his experience and the experience of Adrian sat next to him on the bench was exactly the same. So he got to learn while sitting next to Adrian all of the things and the thought processes that a substitute goalkeeper is going to need when he's going to be in the action and potentially called upon. Yeah, I think that that's it, isn't it? I think we're going to see this a little bit more moving forwards. I mean, obviously, the, the fact that, that Adrian there is maybe not a favourite amongst Liverpool fans. He's not one that would inspire much confidence, I don't think, if he would have had to have, have come on in that game. But I do think there's there's something to be said. I mean, whenever you listen to, to John Achterberg or whoever it is amongst the, the Liverpool coaching staff, they always mention Adrian as being a, a key character, a key personality. I, I think that's that's going to be his role moving forward, really. He's not necessarily going to get on the pitch because Quibbin Kelleher is, is there for the time being. And, you know, there's there's plenty of, of sort of experience between him and, and Alisson that you won't need either Pitaluga or Adrian for the time being. But the fact that they can sort of work with each other, learn from each other, there's a real sort of group mentality, I think, between them all. They all work for each other. They all kind of, of muck in and, and help out with the development. And I think for, for Adrian, I think it's it's a real opportunity for him. Obviously, he's never been at a club the size of, of Liverpool before. He's kind of had his, his moments, I think, in terms of, of the Club World Cup and, and a couple of appearances earlier on. But now this is an opportunity to okay, come in if you if you have to and Kelleher is injured or Alisson can't play or whatever, but it's a real opportunity to kind of pass on some wisdom, mm. be a part of, of this because I think Peter Luger is, is really one for the future and I think uh, if Adrian can help develop him, that will certainly increase his own stature amongst Liverpool fans. <laughs> for sure, for sure. And it, the goalkeepers are already a different breed. I mean, I think we, we have to say that from the beginning. But it's a really interesting thing because obviously there were lots of eyebrows raised when Adrian was given those new contracts in the last summer. But this would have been a big part of why he was given this contract. This would have been something that Klopp and, as you say, John Atterberg would have explained to him his importance in doing that. And it's something that players can take a lot of pride in. I remember recently hearing... Rui Costa talking about how proud he was to see Kaka, the guy who he basically was grooming to replace him, and to see him go on and win the Ballon d'Or. It made him feel good. It's like, I know I've done a good job. And on a smaller level, I mean, Pitts League is probably not going to win the Ballon d'Or, <laughs> unfortunately. But in a similar situation, this is going to be the same thing, isn't it? He's going to be able to watch this young man's career and say, I'm, I played a key part in it. Yeah, exactly that. I mean, there's there's still a long way to, to go, really, in terms of his development. He's still a very, very young player. He only turned 19, Pitaluga, in, in December. So he's, he's still got a long way to go. But you can kind of see that pathway. You can see the influence of the goalkeepers who are more experienced, obviously. Um, they've brought in the, the Brazilian legend now to the coaching staff as well, Claudio Tafarel. So that's another sort of positive thing for, for him moving forwards. And Liverpool have... have sort of on the quiet, got a kind of conveyor belt of, of goalkeeping talent really over yeah. not just the ones that they got now, but even in the past, like they got 12 million for, for Danny Ward, who went to Leicester. They got 3 million last summer for Kamal Grabara, who was nowhere near being sort of in first team reckoning. So, yeah. you know, even, you know, these players who, who don't quite make it are still churning out a bit of a profit. They're still making the club money. I think it, it's really interesting, you know, the, the comments that we've seen over the last couple of months from, those within the goalkeeping department that they want to, to really make that uh, a kind of talent machine, if you like. It's it, yeah. it's a way of of making sure that they can mould goalkeepers in the way that they need them for for the first team. And I think Pitaluga is is absolutely the one that they've got their eye on. I think he's almost a, a certainty, really, to, to go on to be a, a top goalkeeper because when you listen to Alisson, Akterberg, Adrian, whoever it is, they're all absolutely delighted mm. with him. So, yeah, plenty of, of time still to, to develop, but... You know, we've all been so impressed by Quibbin Kelleher. You wonder yeah. how long can he stay and, and be prepared to be number two. But 
if you've got Pataluga, maybe a, a couple of years down the line, maybe give it another couple of seasons. Mm. What Kelleher would be, I think maybe 24, 25 at that point. Pitaluga would be 21. You can kind of see where yes. Pitaluga overtakes him, becomes the number two. Kelleher goes off and then bees a, a number one somewhere else, which I think he's he's absolutely capable of doing. So, yeah, the, there's a conveyor belt of, of talent. Liverpool really, really doing well in that department at the moment. Mm. And yeah, long may it continue. And I mean, I don't really want to think of a world where Kelleher no longer plays for Liverpool, but you are right. The, 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 the rise and the speed of his trajectory has already seen calls for him to maybe go off and be number one somewhere else. Not uh, Republic of Ireland aren't playing in the World Cup this year, but obviously the place of number one keeper is very much up for grabs when you look at some of their other stocks. So it's something that might be tempting him, but obviously if there is this progression plan in place, and maybe that's been explained to him as well, hopefully he'll stick around for a couple more years yet. Yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah, you'd, you'd certainly like to think so in terms of of his development. I think again, he's he's still very young for a goalkeeper. The problem for for both of them really is that you could quite easily see Allison still here in in ten years as as number one. I mean, he's contracted for another five years, but I'd imagine he'd get another contract after that because I think he's twenty nine at the moment. So another ten years. I mean, you know, we've seen plenty of of players, even outfield players, play to, to that sort of of age these days. So yeah. The, there's obviously that to, to think about as well, but I think Liverpool will uh, will continue to to do what they're doing in terms of, of the goalkeeping. Kelleher will will be allowed to stay as as long as he wants because he's a brilliant number two. I think Liverpool have certainly solved that problem. But you know, if ever that was to become an issue and he wanted to move on, they've got another one coming through the the ranks who's a similar mould, which I think is is really important. And when really, you consider- really good with his feet and, and that kind of thing, yes. which I think is is huge. I was just going to say, when when you consider some of the mistakes of the recent past and some of the ghosts, let's say, of the recent past, I think it's very, very comforting to all of us to know that this most important of positions is well stopped for the years to come, as is the whole academy. Matt, half an hour has nearly flown by already We're talking about these young kids. Uh, I've had an absolute ball. I'm sure we will the next time we meet up. Thank you very much. Nice one, mate. Really enjoyed it as ever. Indeed. And I hope you all did out there again. See you in a few weeks.